Good morning, LM family. So great to be able to share God's word with you today. And uh, I just pray that God has already met you in your worship and that He's spoken to your hearts. And today we're going to continue looking at running our race in the last days. So let's just pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that you are our coach. You're the one that leads us in this race that we run. And Father God, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We're looking toward the finish line, Lord, seeing the face of our Savior waiting for us. We thank you, Lord, that today your word will illuminate more to us about how we should run our race in these last days. We thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we took a look at running the wrong race or going in the wrong direction. And today we're going to look at shedding weight. Some of you may be tempted to ask, well, what do you know about running races in any case? Well, I thought I'd uh, show you my comrade's marathon shirt. Yes. I have a friend who ran the Comrades Marathon and he came back and bought me this shirt. But the reality is this, that through this whole process of looking at running this race, I've come to, to share with you that this is not about a sprint. Some of you have already figured that out. But none of us knows exactly how long it's going to be. For most of us, it's definitely going to be a long time. And it's going to be in the long distance category. This is a race that requires perseverance, dedication and endurance. It's a Christian life that is one of extremes. That the extremes that we live in this Christian life are like no other. We need to understand. That once we were lost, but now we are found. Once we were without hope, now we have hope. Once we were walking in darkness, and now we're in light. And so today, we're going to take a look at the importance of this race, and shedding weight, and becoming unentangled. This race that we run, when we get to the finish line, the one who hands out the prize is the King of Kings. I mean, no pressure there. So I want to look at something that makes running this race really difficult. And if you turn in your Bibles, you go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, Stripping off every unnecessary weight and sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us. Let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us. Looking away from all that will distract us. Focusing our eyes on Jesus who is the author and perfecter of faith. The first incentive for our belief and the one who brings our faith to maturity. Who for the joy of accomplishing the goal... Set before him, endure the cross, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. We see from that portion of scripture that we can easily be weighed down and entangled. The word therefore that it starts with, or in the, some of the Bibles it says, wherefore, connects this portion of scripture with the preceding chapter, which is all about the chapter of the men and women of faith. They're a great cloud of witnesses, and their lives speak as a witness to ours. If we could hear what they are saying, Today, they'd be saying to us, keep going, keep running. The Lord helped me through and he'll help you too. Maintain your faith. 
Don't give up. Don't look back. Keep going forward. If they could speak to us today, I believe that they'd say these three things. The reward is better than we can ever imagine. The finish line is closer than we think. And our race is more important than anything else. This passage also tells us that this is an endurance race. It's not a sprint like I said earlier. We all probably know people who start off their Christian walk and they shot out of the blocks. But where are they today? I had a good friend who helped me in the beginning of my Christian walk. But he fell by the wayside after a few short years. You know, if I ran the Olympic marathon, well, which has been postponed for this year, but I'd ha I, I believe I'd have a chance. I'd have a chance to be leading that race for the first 10 or 20 meters. After that, that would be all I have to offer. If I gave everything I had, perhaps I could lead the race for that period. But 42 kilometers is a lot different to 10 or 20 meters. This race that we're in is a marathon. It takes pressing on when times get difficult. It takes no looking back. It takes a mindset that knows and accepts the difficulties that may be par for the course. For those who have run the Comrades Marathon, my hat is off to you. I mean, after running all that distance and then you have to face something called poly shorts. I don't know why they call it shorts. When I watched this on TV, it was long. But I realized this, that those who have trained understand the difficulties that are coming. And we need to realize, we need to look away from the difficulties and focus on Christ. Just like those who are running the comrades look away from the hill and look to the finish line. The weights and entanglements that we find ourselves instead in can spring up real quickly. And we need to understand that those are the things that we need to shed if we're going to be successful in this race. So what do we need to be aware of. Jesus and Paul use different analogies to describe the same thing. Jesus spoke about thorns, the cares of this life, slowly circling, encircling and choking the plant. Paul used the running analogy. He spoke of weights and the sin that easily entangle us while we try and run. You might be okay for a while, but pretty soon, your strength will be drained if you have to carry extra weights. I've spoken much about how I love to watch boxing. And uh, I watched uh, Deontay Wilder versus Tyson Fury. And after Deontay Wilder got a hiding, his excuse was that the costume that he wore to come into the ring, which weighed about 40 pounds, was the reason that he had no legs in the fight. Well, he only carried it a short distance. Can you imagine having to carry that for long distances? I did the Otter Trail a few years ago with some friends of mine. And believe me, you keep everything as light as possible. You carry nothing that's unnecessary or heavy. The whole trail is filled with hills. You're either going up or you're going down and for very short distances you're going on a flat surface. Especially the first morning when your pack is still full of everything. When you have to climb that first climb, you realize that maybe you should have left some of the things behind. You start off okay, but after a while it starts to take its toll. What extra weights are we carrying around? that we should get rid of? What things that are a weight or a burden or impediment to us are we lugging around in this race that we should get rid of? 
You know, most people are trying to get rid of some weight. I asked Mrs. Google, yes, it is Mrs. Google, because she knows everything, what the top five New Year's resolutions were for 2020 and 2019. In 2020, they were this, exercise more, save more, eat healthier, lose weight and reduce stress. We go back one year, exercise more, lose weight, save money, eat healthier and increase self-care. In both years, three of the top five re resolutions are related to or are losing, about losing weight. Weights and burdens make things harder for us to run our race. Weights are things that we carry around that we don't need. They could include guilt, unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, excessive love of material possessions, comfort, pleasure, or fear that weighs us down. It could even be legalism. Not understanding that it's by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we have been saved through faith. We need to be careful, be aware of those weights that we place on ourselves. Sometimes unintentionally, just because of where we've come from or the things that we've seen. The other thing we need to be aware of is entanglement. Can you imagine trying to run your race with your legs tied together? It doesn't work that well. You'll find out very soon when you face plant. Talking about that, I, when I was preparing this, I was reminded of uh, something that happened when uh, my younger brother and myself, we were still at home, and um, our parents had bought us sleeping bags. And we would go and sit and watch some TV at night in our sleeping bag, zip the sleeping bag right up to the chin, keep our arms inside, and then when we had to go to bed, we would just hop down the passage to our bedroom. Everything worked great until one night, while I was hopping down the passage, the little string that ties the sleeping bag together was dragging behind me, and my younger brother stepped on it. And when I went to jump, my face jumped, and my sleeping bag stayed on the floor, and I came face first down onto the ground because my hands were trapped inside the sleeping bag. That's what will happen if we try and run this race entangled. We need to understand that entangling can come very quickly. We've been studying the life of David and I thought I'd use that as the example of being entangled. You know, David struggled in the second half of his life, the second half of his race, the second half of his journey. It wasn't Philistines, it wasn't giants, it wasn't javelins thrown at him, it wasn't spending his whole day on the run. All of those things made him stronger. But the thing that entangled him and got him to go down that slippery slope was a simple thing of lethargy. Lethargy is like a slow creeping ivy that go, grows slowly around a tree and eventually destroys the tree. You see, lethargy and a life of ease will gradually choke out this Christian life that we live. Some people may say that David's problem was coveting or lust, but there was another problem. It was a progressive decay. That started with lethargy. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 says this. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. That he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. He wasn't in battle. 
He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was chilling. And it got him into trouble. It started the slippery slope. That would have been fine if verse 3 had said, How could it be that I will do this evil before God and your husband? Which is what Joseph said. No, verse 3 says this, And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? You see, his lethargy or lukewarmness had led to a roving eye. This eye had then led him to lust. Lust led to coveting. Coveting led to adultery. Adultery led to pregnancy. Pregnancy led to lying and deceitfulness. When the lying and deceitfulness didn't work, it led to murder. David killed one of his own mighty men and his loyal followers. But it didn't start with murder. It started with an entanglement. There's a little thing that we need to look at that it says here in 2 Samuel. It says, David didn't go out into battle when the time came. It was his duty as a king. But he was quite comfortable where he was. And he gave those duties over to somebody else. Instead, he stayed back in the palace and relaxed. When everybody else was fighting in the heat of the battle, David was idle. And this is something my grandmother told my mother, my mother told me, and I'm going to tell you. The devil finds work for idle hands. That's what happened to David. You know, my mom always wanted me to do something constructive during school holidays. But I thought lazing around with my friends was much better. So we, were, we would get together and sit around and chill and talk about various things. And pretty soon we were up to no good. One time, we decided that uh, we wanted to have some excitement. And we knew that down... Uh, about five k's from our house, some guys had built a foofy slide. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a zip line. And um, we lived near Bella Vista, and this foofy slide was down where the builder's warehouse is of the Glen right now. And so we walked down there, took some spanners with us, climbed up the huge tree took off the clamps, rolled up this metal table, carried it all the way home. Then what we did is we broke into the flat next door to my friend, which was on the third story. We connected the foofy slide to the balcony, all the way down to the road. We connected it to one of those little uh, concrete pillars that they used to have on the side of the road. And we spent the day sliding up and down the slips, uh, the zip line. Until we were caught in the flats that we had no business being in. And we wound up getting into huge trouble. Because they went straight and told my mom, which was not a good thing. I'm real glad they didn't tell my dad, but it still wasn't a good thing that they told my mom. And what was the first thing my mom said to me? I told you, the devil finds work for idle hands. Don't ever underestimate the role of idleness and lethargy in getting us into trouble and entangling us. We need to realize that lust and coveting was primarily the reason for this massive downfall but they were not the source. They were the result. We need to guard our hearts, people. We need to get healthy. We need to shed some weight and get out of some snares. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have some lettuce. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 
and we see there are three lettuces that keep us strong and running well. Lettuce number one. Let us throw off everything that hinders. Number two. Let us run with perseverance. And let us, number three, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. You know, I could have preached a message and said, well, you know, throw off everything that hinders you and run with perseverance. But all that would sound like would be try harder, do this, don't do that, be better. But we need to understand that only with number three can we do number one and two. Others can inspire us, but only Jesus can empower us. I want you to realize that this is not about doing more or doing better or being better. It's about realizing that the power of the living God is on the inside of us so that we can accomplish what we need in this race. The job of a pastor is to take inspiration from the lives of Abraham, Moses, David, and then give them to people so that Jesus will use that inspiration and empower them. It doesn't say looking to Moses, the author and perfecter of our faith. We need to realize that we desperately need God to give us that strength. To get through this race. When we do that. And we look. To the author and the finisher of our faith. We'll feel the weights. And entanglements. Fall from us. We will stay light. And we will run well. But in order to do that. We have to look at our coach. God is our great coach. And I'm going to give you some attributes of good coaches number one good coaches have great vision and foresight they can see the big picture you'll find that in Romans chapter 8 verses 29 and 30 it says for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. God saw the end from the beginning. The next attribute of good coaches is that they have a plan on what they want to achieve. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 says this. Through our union with Christ, we too have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. Before we were even born, He gave us our destiny, that we would fulfill the plan of God, who always accomplishes every purpose and plan in His heart. God's purpose was that the Jews, who were the first to long for the messianic hope, would be the first to believe in the Anointed One and bring great praise and glory to God. God had a plan from the beginning. The next thing, is good coaches are able to see problems beforehand and direct or adjust accordingly. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 10 and 11 says this, Our parents corrected us for a short time of our childhood as it seemed good to them. But God corrects us throughout our lives for our own good, giving us an invitation to share His holiness. Now all discipline seems to be more pain than pleasure at the time. Yet later it will produce a transformation of character, bringing a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who yield to it. Coaches are able to inspire and empower. Psalm 139 verses 15 to 17 says this, You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God, that cannot be numbered. We need to understand that our coach is on a totally different level because he sees from eternity to eternity. 
And we need to remember that when the next trial comes. But sometimes the coach's training and discipline does not seem great for the moment. There are various things that we need to look at that are useful in discipline and training. And you could go and read them up in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verses 5 to 11. And I've just listed five of them. Number one, my child don't underestimate the value of discipline and training of the Lord. Number two, the Lord's training of your life is the evidence of His faithful love. Number three, we should welcome God's discipline as a validation of authentic sonship. Number four, God corrects us throughout our lives for our own good, giving us an invitation to share His holiness. Number five, discipline seems to be painful, but it brings a change of character, which brings a harvest of righteousness and peace. This passage shows us that God is active in our lives, not passive. Discipline is not a sign of His anger, payback or frustration. This discipline is looking forward, not looking back. The coach has a reason for training and disciplining. When I was thinking about this, I remembered my time in the army. We had a lieutenant who was like a serious fitness freak. We had to run, do sit-ups, press-ups, sprints, leopard crawl, do all these things. And I started to wonder, was he just a sick individual who wanted to make us suffer? No, he had a plan and it was going to take quite a bit of training to get this group of no-hopers to where we needed to be. It's not easy letting go and trusting God. But God leads us and shows us because He has already seen the finish line. We haven't even got close to it yet. He's the coach. He's the one with the plan. And He's the one who knows what He is doing. So our conclusion for today is simply this. The coach has a higher plan based on a better vision. And he doesn't think like we do. Our coach uses discipline for our good. And best of all, our coach is actively involved with us every single day. I want to say people, we need to shed that weight and be ready to run our race with endurance and persistence. Some people may have never thought about this life that I'm talking about. This life where God trains us and points us in the direction we need to go and then cheers us on and gives us the ability to get to where we need to get to. The way to get into God's coaching, the way to get into God's way of doing things is only by receiving a gift. You have to receive a gift to get there. It's not something you can pay for. This is not a coaching session you pay for by the hour. This is a coaching session that was paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, if you have never received Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and today you would like to come back to God, get on His team, be part of His track team, running the right race, then I'm going to ask you to do something that's real simple. Receive a free gift and make a confession of your faith. What does that mean? It means that you say with your mouth what you believe in your heart. And so, today, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. And at the end of the video, there will be pastors' numbers on the screen. Please call one of them. And they will also pray with you and we'll see how we are able to help you. But pray this with me. 
Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the free gift that you've given me. Thank you that the price was paid. That today I can be your child and you can be my father. Thank you, Lord, that I'm no longer running alone, but you are leading and guiding me. I look to you, Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, family, we're going to do communion. So get your communion elements. I'm going to get my family. And we're going to get together and have communion together in a minute. God bless. Hey family, let's have uh, communion together. We all know what communion means. This is a time of remembrance. We're remembering the price that was paid for us. Each of us individually and then collectively. I read a great analogy the other day and it was about a table for two. And it says, even at the banqueting table, there can be a table for two. In other words, at a big table, two people can sit and be in deep fellowship with each other, no matter who else is around. That's how we are at this table right now. We're in communion with our Father, with His Son Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. And so... It's because of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can come into union with the Godhead. And so we're going to receive our communion elements. And uh, we're going to get ready for partaking of the communion together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11... Verses 23, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Today we remember the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that was broken for us. And so Lord we give thanks. For the body broken. So that we can be made whole. Let's eat together family. And when he had given thanks. After supper. He said this cup. Is the new testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. This is once again an illustration of what was paid at Calvary for us. Father, we thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Poured out so that we can be in right standing with you. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Thank you. And now, family, just a, a couple of announcements. First of all, thank you to all of those that have uh, been so generous in ensuring that our family members in Elohim and those beyond have received food in this time. During this last week, we distributed over three tons of food. That was besides all the hampers we had done before. And this coming Wednesday, we're going to distribute about the same amount, if not more. I want to tell you, if you have any need for groceries, some staples, some fruit and vegetables, Please call me. We will ensure that, that you get put on the list. Obviously, we have a, a limited quantity that we can distribute at this time. But we will distribute that again 
in 10 days time and then 10 days thereafter because we want to ensure that our family are all provided for in this time. Thank you once again. God bless you. Have a fantastic Sunday.